So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my real pleasure to, in, to introduce the kickoff uh, this evening's event, which we're doing the, in collaboration with Kelima. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, Kelima is, is, is a wonderful local institution that comes under the, the tutelage of Ad, formerly Adach. It's now part of TCA, I think, the Tourism and Cultural Authority, and its mission is to translate uh, the work the works of the world's heritage, as, as broad as that, into Arabic, to create. Uh, and it's doing a terrific job, I think. Hundreds of books have been translated. Um, and among them, um, the book that we're talking about tonight, with the author of that book, <coughs> as Sadaqa fil Usul al-Qadima, Friendship in the Ancient World, in the Classical World. Um, we actually did several events with Kelema in the, in the first year that the Institute was in operation back in 2008, 2009, about some of the, some of the best events we've, we've put together on Eisenstein, on Le Corbusier, there was one on Stephen Hawkins, one on Edward Said, which wasn't so, so easy because we did the world of <laughs> text and the critic, which is, and you know, some of those never, never saw the light of day. But um, Kellam is doing a terrific job, and we're really pleased to, to renew our, our collaboration with them. And it's great that, that uh, this book just came out, and David Constant has just arrived as a, a, um, as a, a visiting fellow of NYU Abu Dhabi. He's based in New York. Um, I thought in the spirit of the occasion, I would introduce David using the, the bio in the Arabic book, which... So it says, Nabda an al Mu'allif, so a short, a short blurb about the author. Hassala David Constant, Constant, Min Jamad Columbia, Ala Bacalorius Firiadiet, Fisanet Alfa Tusumia was sit, Wahd was sitting, so he got his baccalaureate, a BA in, uh, in maths, mathematics, uh, in 1961 from Columbia, and his master's. Uh, in 1963. Uh, so, and he also got his PhD from the same university. Um, so his... his, his um, Researches concentrate on ancient Greek and Roman literature, uh, especially comedy uh, and narrative uh, and classical philosophy. Among his uh, works are, are monographs on sadaqa, uh, taqwa, on piety, I guess. Pity. Yeah. Piety. Oh, pity, I would say. Pity. Pity. Oh, it's just taqwa. It's interesting. Alawatif emotions. Uh, tolerance and understanding. Okay. Um, he's also interested in aspects of uh, Epicurean psychology, uh, comedy, uh, and generally ideology in, among the Greeks. Uh, he's also published studies of Ar Aristoteles, Aristoteles, yes, Aristo, uh, and classical literature, etc., etc. So. Uh, he's taught in several universities, but notably he taught for, uh, for several years at the American University in Cairo years ago, and he, and he learned Arabic at that time. Uh, I'm sure he's being very modest when he says he's forgotten it. Um, uh, he's taught at Brown. I think he was at Brown before coming to NYU, and he's currently a professor at NYU, NYU New York. So that is uh, the Nabda Min al I thought, I thought I would do it in Arabic, just to enter into the spirit of the occasion. So David Constant is going to be interviewed by his friend and colleague, uh, Phil Mitzis, Philip Mitzis, who is the AS Onassis Professor of Hellenic Culture and Civilization at NYU New York, um, who, got, who did his education at uh, Williams and then his PhD at Cornell University. Uh, Phil works on Greek epic and tragedy, as well as in ancient philosophy and its reception in Byzant Byzantium and the early modern period. He has taught a wide variety of humanities courses at NYU that focus on ancient, medieval, and modern philosophical, historical, and literary texts. He's also interested in music 
and serves as the academic director of the American Institute of Verity Studies. That's interesting. We'll talk about that as well. But uh, both of you, welcome. Please uh, welcome our two guests. <coughs> So I thought one way of beginning to get into the issue of what was ancient friendship like is I think a lot of people would be surprised if you sort of said, well, what was friendship like in antiquity? I think they'd be very surprised by the answer that the majority of scholars from various disciplines have given for really the past hundred years or so. I mean, if you look at what the anthropologists and the sociologists and the historians and the political theorists have, they have said, they said, well, in, in antiquity, people had friends, but in those relationships, they really didn't have the kind of either effective, or, uh, effective attitudes or care for the other person, the desire that the other person do well, et cetera. That these, were, these were purely objective relations. And one of the things I wanted to ask David was two things. I mean, how do you think, especially since in his book he sort of gives, you know, example after example of sort of evidence that looks pretty straightforwardly as if friends care about each other in the ways that we think, you know, typically tend to think that friends care about each other. So, first of all, the first question is, how do you think people came to, you know, what was it about their theories that drove them to this really counterintuitive kind of conclusion? And then what was it about this that, you know, sort of gave you the impetus to try to correct this? Well, um, just before I begin the answer, I want to say how pleased I am to be here. This is a real honor for me. Uh, it was indeed an entire coincidence that I was coming to visit and work at the NYU uh, campus here in Abu Dhabi, and I learned of the publication of my book, in Arabic translation at the same time right here in Abu Dhabi as well. It's um, something that uh, for me is a very, uh, is, it's a, an emotional moment. So I'm very pleased and thank all who contributed to, to this. Uh, now to get to your question. Uh, I think what happened is that um, classics came to be invaded by anthropology. And in many ways, this is the right way to look at what we do. We are studying an ancient civilization in its entirety, not just some aspects of it. It is another culture. It's, we could say, well, but it's a dead culture. It existed long ago. Nobody speaks those ancient languages. How do we really manage to treat them as though they were a living people? And my answer always is, though, we have thousands and thousands of pages of texts in which they describe how they feel, tell us what their concepts are, and illustrate them in action through their plays and novels and other materials. So we have a lot to work with. And treating them, looking at it as a culture, as a whole, is reasonable. But in a way, this um, new perspective came at a certain cost. It brought notions of uh, that anthropologists work with a great deal, and above all, one of reciprocity to the fore. The, the idea was that in early societies, what we think of as interior, emotional uh, relationships dependent on a kind of autonomous self really weren't like that. They were structured by social obligations, the tribe or the small group, dominated all aspects of human relationships, and what they called friendship really was an understanding of mutual obligation and reciprocity. You do something for me, I am in your debt, and now I have to repay you. And friendship really just was a non-emotive bond of reciprocal obligation. And people of every stripe in uh, the most conservative critics and the most radical critics seem to be in agreement on this. And I have to say, I started out in agreement with it too. I've often said that um, I've reached an age at which I can make a living out of doing nothing more than correcting my earlier mistakes. Uh, because I believed what, what we all believe, I wasn't immune. But I was bothered by the fact that all well, the texts that you describe 
don't speak of friendship this way. They speak of it in a very emotional way. They, the terms they use in ancient Greek, the term for friendship is exactly the same word they use for love. And so it didn't seem to me plausible. In addition, the bonds between friends were so intense. When you see Achilles weeping at the death of his dear friend and berating himself, his other companions have to hold his hands down because they're afraid he will kill himself out of the emotion at the loss of this dear buddy. It's very hard to think that this has nothing more than reciprocity and a debt that is owed to the man, and there's no feeling in it at all. So this is what sparked my interest. You, one of the things you just mentioned now that struck a particular chord, and that is when you talked about uh, friendship, but also with this very strong, affective quality, and also about love. And you often see treatments of love and friendship. You said, well, look, it's the same word. So I guess one of the questions is, how do you, you know, disambiguate those? I mean, some people have argued, you know, it's very hard to, you know, really distinguish the, you know, you might say the psychological component of love and friendship. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to, there are all sorts of ways that people do, but in fact, if we were just looking at it on this kind of continuum of emotion, love and friendship, you know, would be very close in certain ways and the kinds of attitudes. Uh, I mean, only because you yeah. mentioned Achilles and Patroclus, it has a very mm -hmm. strong kind of element. Yeah. Uh, the Greek word for friendship is just the same word as love. Uh, it, it happens to be the word is philia. When we talk of um, an Anglophile, somebody who likes England, uh, that's that file in, in love. Uh, Greek had another word for amorous relationships. That was the word eros, from which we get erotic. So there were two words in Greek that distinguished two fields. When you spoke of love of your children, love of your family, the word you would use is philia, which is the same word that meant friendship. It's very odd because the Greek vocabulary was extremely rich. It was like Arabic in that respect. Latin vocabulary was much more limited in range and number of words, but they did have a word for friendship that was distinct from the word for love. They spoke of amicitia, which we have in English in amicable relations, and it was distinct from amor, as in amorous. So they, the root was similar, but they had a very specific word for friendship. So Greek didn't. For Greek, friendship was just one kind of love. There was love of a person who was a pal and not related to you, that, in that context, philia meant friendship. So I think we don't need to distinguish friendship from other kinds of love. The Greeks wouldn't have seen much point in it. There is my circle of loved ones. It includes my children, my brothers and sisters, my parents, my near relatives, and those extremely intimate friends whom I would call friends. That's the group that consists of what in Greek is called my philoi, my small range of people to whom I am very deeply committed. That's one area. Erotic relations were always viewed with a certain suspicion and uh, were in any case not part of this central set of concepts. Well, one difference I can think of typically, I mean, often, especially in the Greek context, people in love are often you know, described as being subject to the other or somehow mm -hmm. in, you know, slave to the other, et cetera. Whereas in term, you know, typically when people are talking about friendship, the general line, at least among the philosophers, is that, well, friendships can only really occur among people who are pretty much equal. They don't, philosophers don't think that you mm -hmm. can really have friendships between people who are, you know, at least that don't ins instantiate the right kind of values between people who are of widely different either statuses or even you know, all sorts of differences mm -hmm. it might. Yeah. Uh, well, if, uh, here again we can take specific views. We, we know what Aristotle thought. He thought there were two kinds of love. Well, there were the same kind of love, but one of them was between equals, and that was the ideal type. And, but there was also affection and love between people who were unequal. Uh, a prime example is parents and children. Uh, parents and children have a different kind of relationship to each other. Children are indebted to their parents. Think of a six-year-old, for example. 
there's a very strong sense in which the six-year-old loves the parent, and the parents certainly love the six-year-old child, but we recognize that uh, the sense of responsibility, of caring, of nurturing that exists on the part of the parent isn't exactly the same as it is in the child. And the obligations that the parent and children, parents and children have aren't quite the same. When the parents get very old, the Greeks thought that the children who had been brought into this world by their parents, nourish, nourished by their parents, had received the gift of life from their parents, now did have an obligation to look after their parents in turn. And it's that kind of relationship, when they start talking about the obligations that love imposes on you, that I think has led so many scholars to simply reduce friendship and love to an obligatory relationship. There were obligations that follow upon love, um, but I, we have a sense of obligations that follow upon love too. If somebody tells you that person loves you or that person is your best friend, and then when you're in trouble, they turn their back on you, even though they could easily help, you would have some doubts about the sincerity of that affection. In that sense, we do expect things of people whom we love. We don't expect quid pro quo, that every time I give you five cents, you give me five cents back the next day, or I, we're not friends anymore. If one is richer than the other, you might do all sorts of things. So unequal relationships admit of a certain, of love just as much as others do, but, they're, um, a, but they have a slightly different structure. Yeah, but I guess my question would still be, do you think that, I mean, typically some of our intuitions, you know, I'm not talking about mm -hmm. the Greeks now, but let's, let's think of our own t intuitions. We're likely to want to draw some distinctions between love and friendship in some of the following ways. We might say, well, look, I mean, friends are going to have a certain range of attitudes that don't include the kind of abject, you know, loss of autonomy oh, that I someone see. who's yeah. struck by an erotic, you know, moment yeah. might have. So that there, we might want to draw and, and try to explain that. Mm -hmm. The difference between loving someone and being in love. Uh, being in love is not a good idea. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with that. Um, there, um, I've been told that in the Catholic Church, if you are, if when you marry, you marry because you are in love, that may be grounds for annulment because clearly you didn't, you weren't in your right mind when you consented. A curious view, but one in fact that really was held by a number of church theologians. The Greeks, ancient Greeks, would have understood it perfectly. They often referred to being in love, that erotic experience, as madness. They refer to it as something that comes over you, that enters through the eyes and captures you. They didn't think of ordinary, healthy love in that way at all. Uh, what they did think about ordinary, healthy love was that it responded to lovable qualities in another person. Now, this takes us into another area which I think is, is, is worth following. The, um, after all, if I'm going to say, I love this person, it was natural for a Greek to say, why? And the answer might be various. It might be, I find this person very amusing. I've gotten so used to them that I just enjoy being with them. Or this person has helped me in a lot of ways. We have a very close relationship in business. And we've become good friends. We care about each other. But above all, they wanted to say, I like this person because this person has very good qualities of character. That's the basis of my affection. So you are evaluating the qualities in another person. It's a very particular way of looking. You're not overcome by anything. You're making a fair judgment of how that person is, and that sense of the other person inspires love in you. I actually wanted to ask you about that and maybe try to suggest that there might be some puzzles around that. Mm -hmm. Because when we think of you know, valuing another person pretty much solely for the, the good qualities, the qualities they have. You know, I might in, like you because you're humorous. But of course, there are lots of other people who are humorous. Not as humorous. 
Not as humorous, but you know, Chappelle. I think Chappelle's more humorous. So, I mean, if I'm looking at you know what I really like about you, a certain set of values, I might think that well, you know, somebody else, it stands in his values better than you do. So, one, I have a reason to trade up. Second of all, I mean, one complaint that I've you know I've sometimes heard the uh, critiques of say Aristotle's view is that by only valuing a person's qualities and their, you know, wonderful properties, you sort of fail to really value them for themselves. That is, if I tell you, gee, you know, your friends love you because you're witty and you're smart and you're X and give you a whole list of qualities, you know, at a certain point you might say, yeah, okay, fine, but do you really love me for, for me, myself? Mm -hmm. And so... That's sort of one side of the puzzle. And I want to talk about that first to see, you know, you view that as a problem for some of the ancient discussions of friendship, as you mentioned. Right. They, they typically, you know, well, why should I like someone? Well, because they have these good qualities. Right. Uh, here, I think there has been some confusion in the way the ancient texts have been interpreted. Aristotle does say these are reasons why I would like someone. I appreciate that person's qualities of character. At the same time, he's very clear that you can only have a few really close friends in your life at any given time, for various reasons. Uh, he has such a strong notion of commitment to your friends whom you love, that having many would dilute anything that you could possibly do. What do you do when friends have conflicting demands, for example? So Aristotle doesn't simply say, just because someone has lovable qualities, you are automatically friends. No, there has to be many things that intervene. For example, he says, you have to be long-time acquaintances. That's how you get to trust the reliability of this bond. And that you can't trade up very easily. You need to be a long-time acquaintance. Now, the other side of this, which has to do with um, uh, the self, this is more complicated. I'm not sure the ancient Greeks would have distinguished between all the qualities I have and me. I mean, strip away my sense of humor, strip away my kindness, strip away my um, uh, devotion, strip away what I know about things, and what are you left with? It becomes an odd, mysterious hole in the middle. There's a beautiful poem by the uh, Irish poet Yeats, in which, it, I think it's called On Jenny, and it's a woman who asks um, that she be loved for herself alone and not her yellow hair, because she has beautiful blonde hair. And Yeats says, I heard a wise man say once that only God can love you for yourself alone and not your golden hair. In human relations, we love because of the properties we have. Uh, Montaigne, the essayist, coming in the modern world, and thinking quite differently about a self that's this mysterious interior thing, uh, was, had a very dear friend who died young, and he, relatively young, and Montaigne was heartbroken. And he wrote an essay about him, and he said, if you ask me why I loved him, I can only answer because he was he and I was I. In other words, raw chemistry. There's nothing else you can pinpoint. I don't think the Greeks would have thought that way. They would have always said, well, this quality and that quality and the other, and these are lovable things. It didn't automatically mean we would become friends, but it meant that this was the ground of any friendship we would have. Well, I, I, I want to ask you a little more about that in Aristotle and see if it's quite so you know, that we can put those things together quite so easily. That is a kind of prior history and then the sorts of things that we really value. Because, I mean, one of the things I'm thinking is that the Stoics have a very strong view that, you know, the only reason that we have, you know, that we should value someone is for their moral qualities. And they sort of began, you know, looking around and saying, well, who is it that the sage, the sort of paradigmatic wise person with all the perfect virtues, who, is, who could the sage be a friend with? And they came to the conclusion that, well, the only person that a sage could be a friendship with is with another sage. Mm -hmm. I mean, we often meet people, you know, who say, well, 
gee, I haven't really found anyone good enough to be my friend or my spouse. You know, you have to find the person who's good enough. And they came to the conclusion that, in fact, your best friend is another sage, whether you've actually met that person or not. That if what you really value is sort of these qualities and the instantiation of these qualities, that kind of history doesn't really matter. And one of the things I worry about, you know, in Aristotle, I'm trying to put that mm -hmm. together, I think if you sort of said, well, Aristotle, you know, here's his friend. You have this long history with his friend. But of course, this friend has now lapsed in virtue somehow. Mm -hmm. I think Aristotle would be perfectly, in fact, he does say, you know, that prior history doesn't really weigh at all on the scale of, you know, why I really value this person. Yeah. I mean, I think he makes a kind of concession to, as he often does, to common opinion that, you know, in order to have friends, we certainly have to have a kind of history with them. We have to share the same sorts of activities. But when push comes to shove, I think the claim is what you really care about is this person's virtue. And then I think that pushes you into those kinds of problems yeah. we were. Well, I don't, and I, I think there's, yeah. there is a kind of tension there just mm -hmm. in our you know, ordinary ethical thinking yeah. about the relation of you know, a person's prior history with you and then you know, what they're next. You know, think of every time a, 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 one of your elementary school friends has shown up after 40 years. You know, there is this kind of history, but then there, there are these other questions. Yeah. Well, Aristotle actually raises exactly that example. Right. Uh, and um, he says, when he puts it differently, when your children, you, know, you have friends who are close and they're pretty much like you, and then later in life, sometimes one of the two has developed, matured, in ways very different from the other. And you not necessarily have been separated, but as you continue to have a relationship, you realize it's not the same equality as before. You've progressed. Maybe intellectually, maybe in the business world, you've had a stellar career. And it's very sad to say that sometimes your childhood friend is not long, any longer at your level. Let's put it in the most general way. And Aristotle says, well, what do you do then? Do you have no friendship at all? But they, it wouldn't be Aristotle to make that conclusion. The Stoics would, but not Aristotle. He says, oh, no, no, you still retain a love and a commitment, even though it dims a little, because you have the memory of that bond and the sense of trust and mutuality. So Aristotle is very sensitive to exactly that kind of issue. And I think, um, I have to say, I think it's realistic. I would add one more point. When Aristotle talks about his definition of love, he says love is the desire that good things happen to the person you love and that you make every effort to bring those about within your capacities. So that's his definition, just that. Except I left out one word. He says... Love is doing, wishing for the other person what that person thinks is good. Now, here's something the Stoics would never say. The Stoics would say, and Plato would say, oh, no, it's not what that person thinks is good. It's what's really good that I want for that person. But Aristotle's a bit more sensitive. If I love you and I trust you, very often... With a child, yes. With a child, I'm not going to give a child what the child thinks is good. Wants a huge dessert every day, and I know it's not good for the child. It thinks it's good, but, but I don't, and I, that's a different kind of relationship. But if it were a friend, I might help the friend do something that wasn't strictly according to my values. But I respect and love the person that way. So Aristotle makes a lot of room for considerations at the mortal level and not always absolutes. But I wonder if, if there's, there might be a slippery slope there. Because in the following way, let's say, you know, my friend thinks stealing is good, and, you know, I want to indulge my friend, and I come to think that stealing is good. And so the two of us now have this kind of friendship of thievery. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly Aristotle's not going to allow that into his. That's right, he won't. <laughs> but I, I'm, one of the things I'm wondering, a lot of contemporary people have sort of worried about these cases about, well, is there something about friendship 
even among really despicable types, that we can you know, pick out and characterize as friendship that's independent of the, the actions we're doing? Or are we more inclined to you know, go back mm -hmm. up the scale to Aristotle and yeah. think, well, we're going to start drawing the lines of what counts as friendship if people are doing really horrendous things. Mm -hmm. uh, these are questions that, uh, in their own terms, the ancient thinkers struggled with. There's no question about it. They are, um, can evil people be friends? Well, if you love people because of their good qualities of character, then presumably even evil people like about the other person something they think of as good. Loyalty, which could be loyalty to a bad cause, but at least it's loyalty. And uh, I should add that the concept of loyalty in antiquity is a complicated one, and I don't, don't even really know how to say it in ancient Greek, but it's an important idea. Uh, Cicero raises a problem. Uh, in the um, Roman Republic, the brothers, the Gracchus brothers, the Gracchi, were revolutionaries and were finally killed. And the conservative faction around Cicero in later times, uh, 75 or 100 years later, look back at them as examples of very bad types who were willing to stir up the mob and overthrow the state for their personal benefit. That's how they regarded them. So they didn't regard them as good people. And Cicero, who wrote a whole little essay on friendship, said, raises the problem, suppose you are friends with one of these guys, and he tells you to burn down the Temple of Jupiter, which is located on the Capitoline Hill. Would you do it? And he records the answer of a Stoic named Blossius, who said, he would never ask me to do such a thing. So, he trusts the virtue of his friend. But Cicero's not content to leave it there. He says, but what if he did? And that became a standard argument in antiquity. Would your loyalty to the state override bonds of friendship, even if these were the deepest kinds of friendship? And you can't wriggle out of it by saying he would never say such a thing. Blossius is quoted as saying he would do it. And it reminds me of the, um, uh, the comment, uh, who was it, the um, Howard's End author, uh, the modern um, oh, British author who wrote um, A Passage to India. Of course. Yeah, uh, Foster, right, who said, um, if I were ever asked whether I would sooner betray my friend or my country, I would hope I would have the courage to betray my country. Now, that kind of attitude didn't sit well with the people in, in Rome or in Greece. What's curious in my mind is that Aristotle never raised that question. He himself seemed to think that a group of, that friendship was based on goodness. Good people would do good things. And both he and Cicero add that true friends tend to agree on the fundamental things about life. That's one of the marks of a true friend. Uh, now, this raises your other question. Well, bad people also agree on the fundamental things about life. They agree on stealing and robbing or killing and doing all kinds of terrible things. So shouldn't they be friends? And Aristotle says, well, one of the things about bad people is that they're inconsistent. So they don't even agree with themselves, much less with other people. So that's one of the reasons they can't be friends. Right. I want to skip you ahead towards a, a later part in your book when, you're, when you start talking about how this all works out in Christianity. And if I'm taking an Augustinian view of the world, you know, we are all sinful, and we continue to be sinful until God's grace somehow saves us. Mm -hmm. So I, as a sinful human being, you know, do you think there's a possibility of Christian friendship? I, in my book, I explored that topic, and what is noteworthy is that many Christians reject the language of friendship. 
when they talk about the bond that connects them. They substitute brotherhood. The priest to this day is father. Monks are brothers. Nuns are sisters. And the language of kinship subtly displaced the language of friendship toward the, in late antiquity, with what, by which we mean the third and fourth and fifth centuries AD. All right, well, that roughly when it happened. And I wondered at some of the reasons. Various reasons have been given. Uh, but I thought one of them might well be the following. If people who are friends are friends because, in the ideal sense, they admire each other's virtue, then isn't it difficult to claim friendship with someone on the grounds that that other person must be admiring your virtue? But if you know you are a sinner, then how can you lay claim to virtue and claim that the other person loves you for that? And what I discovered was that the Christian writers, not all of them, but the ones who most insisted on their sinfulness and who were most insistent that they had no, nothing that could be called virtue because they were fundamentally sinful were just the ones who would never claim to be friends with anyone else. It was a very clear division between those who said, I have all sorts of virtuous qualities, my piety, my holiness, my dedication, very other good things. And so I can very well be friends with someone else who loves me for my virtues. And those who would write letters beginning from Paulinus, sinner, to Augustine, fine person. But he always began by calling himself a sinner in any letter that he wrote. And he never makes any claims to friendship. So I have an intuition that when Christian, the Christian emphasis on our fundamental sinfulness, lifelong sinfulness, sinfulness we can never really escape because it's inherited from the, the curse of Adam and Eve, came to be the dominant view, no, traditional notions of friendship were harder to maintain. Well, that's interesting because it, it brings up another feature that you often associate with, you know, sinfulness in Christianity, and that's the kind of confessional mode. That you know, one of the things that you do is you confess your deepest urges, etc. And what strikes me is that I don't know. How, you know, you can tell me. You can tell us perhaps how much you think that goes on in, you know, before Christianity. But certainly mm -hmm. a feature that you often hear about in accounts of contemporary friendship is a sort yeah. of confessional mode where friends tell each other their deepest secrets and their deepest desires and their deepest worries. And, and so you have a kind of friend who is acting as your, con, you know, confessor. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could say something. There's very little about that in antiquity. I do think that's one of the sharp distinctions between modern and ancient conceptions of friendship. It is true that in antiquity, one of the things that you valued a friend for in certain circumstances was that you could confide politically dangerous thoughts to that other person. So if in a world where there was always political faction fighting and tensions and threats of revolution, you had to know who was reliable and whom you could trust. And yes, you would only confide serious secret to that other person. But this was not a kind of precondition for intimacy. When I was reading up on modern friendship, that was, just as you say, omnipresent everywhere. What friendship implies is opening your heart, confessing everything, showing your inner self to that other person, as though perhaps the things we're ashamed of are the things we most want to reveal rather than the ancient view that the basis of friendship is our virtues. And it's not that you'd want to conceal your defects, but certainly you'd want to cure them. Uh, so there wasn't this sense of uh, intimacy in that way. I remind you again of Aristotle's definition of friendship, which wasn't so different from others, namely to wish for the other person what is good for that person. There's nothing to say about um, Feelings, even, it has to do with desires, but not the tingling feeling of love. It has nothing to say about confessions and sharing of secrets. In the monastic life of Christians, however, 
openness about confessioning of, confession of sins came to be important. However, I think it was a separate matter, I think, from friendship per se. Uh, within the church, and also I would say within the philosophical schools, it became important to make clear your weaknesses and your deficiencies so that you could make progress toward virtue and toward happiness. And uh, there was an emphasis placed on frankness, on openness. That's perfectly true. But frankness and openness in the entire school or monastic situation, not as a special condition between two individuals. In fact, uh, private confessions, private openness between any two monks in the monastery was looked down on. The uh, personal, very close personal relations could sabotage the integrity of the entire monastic group. So indeed, um, they, there was confession, but it didn't serve the purposes of friendship the way it does in modern, modern right. conception. And one of the other things I think a lot of, of you know, in the sort of contemporary, you might say, uh, self-help accounts of this stuff, that what this confession does, I mean, what, what you're doing by confessing is revealing your true individuality mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, and we talked a little before about <clears throat> an emphasis on the individual, qua individual, as opposed <clears throat> to liking them for the qualities. And what this confession is supposed to do is you get to know the other person's unique individuality. And sort of once I remember talking about this with a psychoanalyst, and I said, well, at least you know, was complaining about the horrors of the job and having to sit there and listen to it. I said, well, at least you could hear, you know, all these very personal, interesting stories and details. And I said, after about two weeks, they're all the same. <laughs> the idea being that this notion of, yes. you know, deep individuality is really mm -hmm. not that yeah. deeply individual. In one book that I read about modern friendship, uh, there was an interesting contrast. Uh, the, the fellow was describing the homes of people of different social classes. The lower social class, not very poor, but more ordinary people, which is the way I kind of family I grew up in, uh, you furnished your home to look more or less the same as everybody else's home. You wanted the same bedroom set, the same sofa, it might be a different color, but uh, the choice was limited and you all knew what you wanted. You had more or less the same pictures and prints on your wall, uh, slight variations according to taste or according to what you happen to own or find, but pretty much your house looked like the home of your friends and neighbors. When you went way up the social scale, there suddenly became an emphasis on looking as different as possible. This one had an African mask on the wall, this other person had a bed that folded up in seven ways, and so on, and you brought people in because your home was now an expression of your individual self. And that became important. So here, within a single society, but just according to different strata, this happened to be in English, I'm uh, describing England, but it wasn't so different from the United States and probably not so different from here. The, um, Within a single society, there was this level of difference. Uh, <clears throat> the emphasis on our uniqueness uh, is, um, you, you're right, it ends up being dull because everybody's unique in the same way. But there is, a, it's, it's very specific to, um, it's specific to a certain kind of ideology and not as universal as we think. Right, no, I was just gonna say, every Park yeah. Avenue apartment looks exactly the same. Every so, NYU apartment looks the same. No, Park Avenue apartment looks exactly Oh, Park the Avenue, same. yeah. But anyway, um, we haven't talked too much about the political connections with friendship, which is certainly a large topic in antiquity, mm -hmm. and, and especially, as we said, many scholars have just more or less <laughs> equated friendship right. and politics in a certain way. So I'm, when, in, in a couple cases, if you could maybe highlight you know, places where you think your account of friendship helps to illuminate things like, you know, that were very important in antiquity, as, for instance, patronage, or you know, anyone who's been in politics for even a few seconds has to deal with the problem of 
friends who flatter and what that does to your political judgment. And I mean, that clearly has to be a worry when we have very powerful figures who are surrounded by, you know, their friends who flatter them. So could you say something? And, and I'm no. thinking maybe that looking at the time so that we can open this up for questions, maybe we could stop with that and then, mm -hmm. you know, take questions from the audience. Well, you had three points there. You had mm, political friendships, you had uh, flattery, and you had patronage. And um, let me try to take them all up briefly. Um, both Aristotle and Cicero, uh, actually Cicero's brother, say that when it comes to politics, we use the word friend more broadly. So a politician comes around and says, you are my friends. And he's speaking to a large crowd. And Aristotle actually says, political friends. We mean something looser when we're on campaign. Cicero's brother wrote an election, electioneering manual on how to get elected to office. And one of the things he says is, when it comes to canvassing for votes, yes, you call all those people your friends, even though in real life, your intimate friends are a very small group. So in that respect, there was a recognition of, uh, of the nature of friendship. On patronage, <clears throat> this is a very particular concept in Rome. There is a, um, a patron in Rome was a wealthy aristocrat who was able to protect you when you, as a poor person, were in trouble, and he did this very often in return for your vote when he was standing for election. Or he could bring legal, uh, his legal skills to bear if you were in trouble in court, and he could actually speak in your favor. Uh, more generally, patrons even gave out uh, baskets of food uh, to their clients, as they were called in the Roman system, these are their supporters who would gather around and actually wait each morning at their door to be handed out a basket of goodies because that was one of the ways you maintained your authority with your crowd. One Roman once said, if I had to fight a battle, I could raise an army just from my clients, from the people who depend on me. Now, in those relations, are we going to call it friendship there is a view that says, for polite purposes, for polite purposes, people refer to the relation between this all-powerful patron and his humble client as a friendship, in order not to embarrass the humbler figure. Uh, in a book recently edited by a colleague of ours at uh, NYU, an article in the book said, cited inscriptions in which soldiers thanked their superior patrons. And in about 150 cases, they wrote, to my patron, and they built a little monument for him. And in four of those examples, they wrote, to my friend and patron. And the chapter writer concluded, mentioning me, by the way, in particular, that you see, friendship and patronage meant the same thing. All it meant was a fa friendship was a fancy word applied to this relationship between very unequal people. To which I replied, if that's the case, why didn't all 150 inscriptions say to my patron and friend? Why only four? Isn't it possible that in those four cases, the person, humble as he was, also was a friend to the patron, also was someone who had a personal relationship that could be so described. And that's the basis in which I was claiming, and still claim, that the patron relationship was very rarely described euphemistically as friendship. Basically, it could be friendship between upper class or and low class people. It wasn't automatic, but on occasion, they would find a bond and they would like each other. And this takes me into the last point, which has to do with false friends and flatterers. It's again very interesting that Plato and Aristotle pay very little attention to the problem of the distinguishing flatterers from friends. Well, they know people can flatter, 
But when they write about friendship, that's not a big problem for them. When you come to the period of the great imperial states, Rome being one of them, Egypt being another, with the Ptolemies, all of a sudden, people start writing about how to distinguish, how to tell whether a person is a flatterer or a friend. Why is that? I think you really hit on it. If you are friends at court, you or you are at court, you're a courtier, you're a member of a king's retinue, you stand to gain quite a lot if you are considered a friend of the king. That's a good thing to be. And you have motives to try to insinuate yourself into the friendship of that leading figure. Now, your motives might be selfish, in which case you're a false friend, or your motives might be genuine, in which case you really love that king, and that king needs your good, sound, honest advice. Needs you to be frank, not to be a flatterer. But in order to know which one to trust, the king has to know how to distinguish true friends who have love him for himself and false friends who love the king or the queen because they stand to gain something personal and they might mislead the ruler into doing the wrong things. This was a genuine problem. It is raised in a number of our texts. Uh, they give you strategies for learning how to distinguish, and they recognize in the last analysis how difficult it is. They go so far as to say, of course, a false friend might pretend to speak frankly and disagree with you in order to show how honest he was really being and encourage your trust. So there was a concern. In the democracy, when we're talking about ordinary people being loving each other, there wasn't so much you could gain from being a false friend. It wasn't worth flattering. And so there was less concern with the problem. But there was a concern <laughs> about politicians flattering the people. There was a lot mm. of talk in the democracy. You're absolutely about, right. The one place where you did stand something to gain was to flatter the people who then you, they were the, they were the power. Uh, just before we, we do sign off, I want to say once more to thank uh, uh, people here and to make one point that may not come out in the question period, which is um, I studied uh, Greek and Roman friendship, and it seems to me that a comparative study that would include friendship in, broadly speaking, the Arabic tradition is something very, very much to be desired. And I agree. <clears throat>Does, um, did the Greeks understand friendship um, to um, require you to instruct a friend in virtue? So, for example, if two people were friends and they had different opinions about something being a virtue, say one friend believed in religion and the other friend didn't, mm -hmm. did that compel the friends to try to argue with each other and try to get them to accept what their opinion of that virtue was, or did it lead them to accept each other for who they were and love them for not having that virtue? It's a very good question. Uh, in general, my sense of it is that they were able to, re if, if they already loved someone, remember that involved a high estimation of who the other was, they were, of course, would discuss matters, the most personal and, and important matters that they believed in, but it didn't make it a condition that the other person share all beliefs. And I give as my example Cicero himself. C Cicero's very closest friend was a man named Atticus. We have correspondence between them, and the intimacy of these two men, especially when they were apart, they were writing to each other regularly, about 100 letters, uh, is really amazing. Uh, I am missing you daily. I think about you constantly. In fact, uh, sister, they, they married their daughter and son together. Uh, but um, this Atticus was an Epicurean. Died in the world Epicurean. Pleasure was the highest goal of life. He avoided political entanglements and never ran for office because that would just disturb his personal tranquility. And Cicero was hostile to Epicureanism. And yet they were the dearest friends. Uh, it used to be thought also that members of opposing political parties would never be friends with each other, but they would only be friends within their party. 
And so it was even thought that the Roman friendship meant nothing more than political allegiance. But somebody, very why a great scholar, Peter Brunt, did a study of all the political figures about whom we can, who say they were friends. And it turns out political conviction has nothing to do with it. Friendship runs across party lines all the time. So I think my guess is that ideology played a smaller role in antiquity. I wouldn't say none, but a smaller role both in their theoretical view and in their practical attitudes. Well, I would like to start off with a quote that made me think. Tell me who your friends are, and I will tell you who you are. Uh huh. Comment on this and briefly mention it. Uh, it's your values, right? So, mm -hmm. what extent can they change your values, change who you are? Mm -hmm. And and another question that's slightly tied to this is that how 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 about focus the question on the effects of that? Right. Um. On the last part, um, <laughs> Phil will probably have other things to say here. I, um, uh, in, in, in marriages very often and in uh, friendships sometimes, I find that there are three parties. There are the two people and then there's the relationship. And as soon as people start talking about the relationship, I will begin to worry. <laughs> so uh, I, I think sometimes the, um, this extra party to the, to the equation can be a problem. On the tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are, and more centrally, your second point about um, a kind of coercive nature to friendship. That is, I'm your friend, but I'm your friend, and I want to do, as your friend, I want to do what's good for you, and I have my notion of what is good. And our friendship depends, ultimately, on my ability to persuade you of it and to convert you to my views. I think the ancient conception of friendship, broadly speaking, was more liberal than that. Again, Aristotle says, do for the other person what that person thinks is good, not just what the person you think is good for that person. There has to be some shared values. You wouldn't be friends with that individual if there hadn't been some shared values. So it's on that basis that you become friends in the first place. And if that other person is telling you, well, for this friendship to be perfect, you have to make these further steps, it's as good as saying, I'm not yet your friend. Not really, not entirely. We are partially friends, but the full flourishing of our friendship will only occur when all of our values coincide entirely. Now, when the ancients say that friends think alike about the basic things, uh, there is at least the recognition that common values are very often crucial to having a friendship. Uh, and we have all seen situations where a sufficient departure in convictions and commitments can damage a friendship. As people grow, they change their, their minds on things. But I think too much pressuring, too much uh, badgering another person would be a sign of a failure to respect that other person's views and to respect the virtues that you've already found in that person. Yeah, there's actually a lot, of, a lot of writings about how people fall into friendships. So, look, how do we acquire friends? I mean, you know, it happens to be the person next door. It happens to be, especially when we're young, we sort of, develop, you know, we we acquire friends basically through association. We give you this kind of association account, a psychological account, which says, well, you start hanging out with someone and you sort of begin to grow attached to them. But they always say, at a certain point, you have to begin to evaluate whether this friendship is really good for you. And that it's easy to fall into these things, but unless you do the further step, of saying, you know, rationally evaluating and saying, is this really the sort of person I want to hang out with? And is this the sort of person who can be my friend and I want to be my friend? So they say, you know, what you describe sounds like a tension in making that transition from 
well, I've acquired this person who was, I'm spending a lot of time with to what they would then say is the next step, which is, is this really, you know, the sort of friend that I need, that I'm good for my friend, that my friend is good for me? If the friendship is based on people being equal, intellectually, financially, and so on, uh, and if life progresses and there were competition for a limited uh, opportunities, that friendship, would, that the, would the ego was introduced by in, in the old Greek thought about mm-hmm. handling that situation? Mm-hmm. And the reason I'm asking that question is um, in an Eastern uh, country, which is known for what used to, well, was known for lifetime employment and people working long hours, basically their friends were their colleagues at work. But then, uh, after the automatic, automatic uh, promotion period stops after 10 years in that company, the spots, uh, the pyramid start to become narrow, and all of a sudden those friends start to become rivals, and then ultimately they become even worse as time progresses. Mm-hmm. Because they started on an equal basis, and then, as you mentioned, if I understood you correctly, Aristotle said that friendship has to be between equals. Was there any reflection of that in, uh, in the ancient time thinking? Mm-hmm. I would say something like this. Greece, ancient Greece, was an extremely competitive society. They competed in the Olympic <laughs> Games, of course, and many other games. If you went to the theater, you always had one play that had to be judged first, one play second, one play third. There were judges. In almost every aspect of life, you know, one of their favorite sports was cockfights. Uh, someone had to win and someone had to lose. And I'm inclined to think, it isn't something I've thought about much before, but now that you raise the question, that part of the value placed on friendship was that it could create a local bond between people in spite of the pressures of competition. It was that little area where you could trust the other person for mutual love and help that would endure and overcome the tension between two people. Uh, One of the um, sayings that Aristotle, well, two sayings Aristotle liked. First, he said, a friend is another self. It's just you in another body. Another one he liked was, the possessions of friends are in common. Now, that's for us a very strong idea. But if we believed it, if we took it seriously, then the person who rises up in the business would not necessarily be split as radically from the person who remained below, at least not economically, and maybe not even in prestige, because he would keep that person at his side, share what he possessed. Uh, It's hard in our much more isolated kind of society to imagine a bond that strong only among friends. But uh, another thing Aristotle says is when you have a friend, the thing you want to do is spend every day, all day with that person. He's thinking of a very powerful kind of bond between two people that could not only survive such a difference, but actually was designed to allow people to stay together despite differences of that sort. I'm, I, I'm guessing. Yeah. Should I play devil's advocate for a minute? Sure. Because I want to I stress sort of the agonistic feature of... Greek Mm -hmm. thought, and if I'm thinking both at the very beginning of the tradition in Homer, and then also even among the philosophers, you have a lot of philosophers, you know, you have Seneca saying, oh, you know, there's nothing better than having friends, and there's nothing better than sharing with your friends, there's all these rules about beneficence, etc. But there's a certain moment in the letters when he says, but of course, you know, if you don't have any friends, you have your own riches. You know, your whole city goes, you know, everything is destroyed. Still, you, as an ego, your point, can be perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's great to have them. In fact, he says they're absolutely necessary. But of course, if you're alone, you can be absolutely happy by yourself. And I mean, going all the way back, even this great Mm -hmm. relationship between Achilles and Patroclus. I mean, remember Achilles' mandate is to be better than everyone else. And mm-hmm. even though he's grieving for his friend and doing all this stuff, you know, a lot of it is inflected by this notion of 
this has been a harm to me. This has been a harm to my honor that, mm. you know, what it's really about is me. And so I see a lot of the, uh, the, the sort of talk about friendship in antiquity is trying to somehow negotiate this, you know, intense drive for self-perfection, self-promotion, you know, being better than everyone else and still trying to accommodate, you know, what mm -hmm. you're saying. But I don't, I, I don't always see that sense that you were describing of, gee, in all that competition, I really need to have some place to get away from it. <laughs> you know, I need this well, psychological... Yeah. A safe zone. Safe zone. Uh, well, two things here. Well, one is a, a, a view of Aristotle's, which is that loving consists, friendship consists more in loving than in being loved. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that even the most prosperous man cannot be happy without friends is that happiness depends on being virtuous, but virtue isn't for Aristotle just a possession. He says you can't be virtuous when you're asleep because you're not doing virtuous things, and therefore you can't be happy when you're asleep. So you need to exercise virtue. And if you have no friends, how can you exercise generosity? And display your magnificence. Display your magnificence, and but it's, it's an much exercise. better to give because you're displaying your magnificence mm -hmm. to someone who's receiving it. Well, yes, but it's someone you love. And that, if it isn't that, then it's not friendship. Then it's something else. Then it's like magnanimity or generosity. Yes, people right. want to show off, but they also want to help their friends. And if you don't have friends, you can't do it. But let me all then, then switch to another story. There's an ancient writer, Lucian, uh, who wrote in the second century AD. And he wrote a curious, he wrote a lot of funny things. And this is well, mostly funny essays. And one of them was called Tuxerus. It's a name. And it's also called Or On Friendship. And the story is this. Toxerus is a Scythian. He comes from the area which is now the Crimea in, uh, in, in Russia, or Ukraine and Russia. And uh, he, the Scythians were nomadic people then uh, and regarded by the Greeks as still examples of primitive people. And the other person is a Greek who is discussing friendship with the Scythians. And so they say, which, who are better friends, Greeks or Scythians? And each one thinks their friendships are the better ones. So they have a contest. They're going to tell five stories each about loyal friends. One guy <coughs> tells a story about the Scythian, about how um, he was somebody was traveling on the road with his wife and two children and a friend. And the friend on the road had saved his life against some bandits, but had gotten a wound in the leg in the course of it. And then they were lodging in a house, and a fire broke out in the house. And the guy said to his wife and child, children, his wife, save the children as you can. And he ran in and saved his friend. And when he came down, some of the Greeks outside thought, well, this isn't very right. He should have saved his wife and child. And, and he said, well, you know, I can always get another wife and child, but friend like that, impossible to get another one. So that was one of the Scythian examples. But what really intrigued me was the last story the Greek tells. And this bears on the question. There are two friends, and one of whom gets in trouble. He's actually taking place in Egypt. Uh, gets in trouble, and he's falsely arrested for a crime he didn't commit. He's under very bad circumstances, and his friend goes into jail with him. He confesses to another crime just so that he can be next to him. He's a stronger guy. He helps him. He gives him all of part of his property. Finally succeeds in proving the innocence of his friend. They are released from jail. The king of Egypt, or the governor, I forget, I think it was the king, actually, um, recognizes the loyalty of this friend. And he says, just for what you've done and the, the beautiful friendship between you, he gives him a vast sum of money to each one. And you'd think that would be it. He suffered in jail. He gave up his liberty. He was on the point of himself being killed just to help his friend. And then comes a surprise. To me, it was a surprise, and I'm still not sure I understand it. And it bears on the question. As soon as his friend is now fully recovered, fully restored, and wealthy, the one who helped him says, okay, now I've done my duty as a friend, 
and he goes off to India by himself to study with the ancient Hindus and become a completely self-realized person who doesn't need friends anymore. Right. And I don't get this story coming at the end of this celebration of friendship, but I think it very neatly captures right. the paradox of the Stoics and all the rest, that the friend, the, the truly virtuous person is self-sufficient, and yet friendship remains a basic value. And that was an incredible display of virtue. And I mean, one of the, one of the things that you do as a Stoic is, or, you know, is you display your virtue in all sorts of ways, because yep. it shows your virtue. You do. You mentioned that being, being in love, giving love, two different things. But I wonder, aren't they complementary to each other? A person can be in love mm -hmm. when she or he is giving love. Mm. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. I think you said uh, sending love and uh, being in love. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. So aren't they complementary to each other? Well, you know, uh, in English, because we say being in love and loving, and we use the same word, it, they, they look very similar. In ancient Greek, the words are different. Uh, have different roots, eros and philia. And, uh, you know, I, I asked myself <coughs> not so long ago, whether, how, what the relationship between these two terms were. It's not absolutely clear. For example, love is very clearly an emotion for the Greeks. Being in love is not entirely clear. Being in love, this passionate desire, is more like an appetite. They tended sometimes to think of it as being an extreme hunger. And they often compared the passion of desire for someone to hunger and thirst or even the desire for sleep. On the other hand, if it's just an appetite, then animals should be able to have this, be in love too. We don't think of animals as being in love. And one of the things that being in love does to you is, according to the ancients, it makes you overestimate the qualities of the other person. <coughs> so, oh, she's wonderful. She's the smartest person I ever saw. She's absolutely the most gorgeous. And then your friend's Come, you know, well, it wasn't that special, but they're not in love, so they don't see those qualities. <coughs> uh, and we, we don't think of, you know, when two dogs are together, we don't imagine the one dog saying, you know, that's the be most beautiful other dog I've ever seen, and being wrong about it. So if belief enters into it, that's a human quality too, and it's a conscious quality, so it's, it can't be just raw <coughs> appetite, there must be something more. It was something I tried to puzzle out, and I confess I had some trouble. I published the article in a um, Polish neurological journal, which ensured that friends like my friend Phil might not see it and find out how little I knew about the subject. But it was, um, it, it really did come to, uh, to ask about the connection. How, what are the basic elements of being in love as the Greeks conceived of it? And again, because the words are different, it, by and large, people haven't tried to ask simply, are they connected or are they not? In the end, I am inclined to think they are connected, but not so obviously as they seem to be in, in, in English, at least. Thank you. If you have a true friend, right. would you have to be a friend with your friend's true friend? Ah, very, very good question. Um, there was a tendency to think that you would. There was a tendency to think that you would. But it um, ran up against the problem that you can only have so many true friends. Uh, for Aristotle, since being a friend meant spending all the time with a friend and helping in every way, there were practical limits to how many you could have. And so I think what the Greeks and Romans meant was you would be well disposed toward the friends of your friends, 
just because they were the friends of your friends, but it didn't necessarily mean that those friends were part of your smallest circle. You, you didn't have a small group of, let's say, five people, all of whom were true friends and no outsider could belong. I don't, they, I, I don't recall an explicit discussion of that question, but my impression of it is that uh, there, was a, there was not such a claustrophobic sense of the relationship. Um, to what extent does, because um, expressing virtue seems to, um, you have to exercise um, virtue and it comes with a cost. And mm -hmm. so to what extent um, in Greek that they allowed themselves to be compromised? Like, that to, they allowed to, themselves to be compromised. To be comp compromised. Compromise. To compromise their own interests. Uh -huh. Compromise their own interests. Oh, well. So, question about altruism. Yeah. If... Your, um, if your friend is another self, then it's rather hard to compromise yourself because you are really two, two of the same selves. Uh, they, uh, you, uh, they're another you. They're another same person. That's how the Greek expression actually translates. Uh, so um, a certain amount of uh, a very deep sharing is presupposed. Uh, you know, uh, Phil just mentioned altruism, this question of giving to the other. And there has been a discussion about altruism in antiquity. There were um, some uh, intellectuals who held the view that might makes right, that doing what is best for you is, and gaining all the power that you can is always the practical ideal to which we all strive. You can talk about virtue. You can tell me what you like about uh, how high-minded values and being fair to others. But I tell you that what people really want is power. But what I know, and these were, these were the I, models of egotism. But in every single case, and this may be peculiar to Greece, in every single case, these highly egoistic people said, I want power so that I and my friends will enjoy the best things. In every case, from Callicles to Thrasymachus, I and my friends. In other words, here people who are represented in our text as speaking for the most selfish possible reasons were at the same time not thinking that being an isolated, lonely figure was the ideal of happiness. No, they felt that the people dear to them would always benefit if they had everything that they could have. So I think the Greeks tended to think, and I also am inclined to think, we tend to think, that egotism, it's, it's a kind of modern idea that I want something just for me. Any person a normal person has a circle of dear people. I want it for my children. I want it for my parents. I want it for my siblings. I want it for my dear friends. I want it for my wife. I want it for my wife's family. In other words, people close to me, I want to be able to share in the advantages I have. And this was, if, if this is the view of the most selfish people in antiquity, then I expect it was a commonplace attitude that um, you didn't mind Having, other, having to share with other people, the real problem would be having no one with whom to share. Um, there's a concept we employ nowadays, uh, maybe only a couple hundred years old, we might call it the concept of romantic love, uh, which tends to get distinguished on the one hand from lust, and on the other hand from the kind of love involved in friendships. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is there an analog to that in the ancient world? Does eros, is that more lust uh, than romantic, that what we would think of as romantic love? <laughs> you know, I think it's somewhere in between lust and romantic love. It, uh, let me be, be clear. Being in love, eros for the ancient Greeks, didn't mean just sex. That's very clear. Sex was one thing and being in love was quite another. When you were in love, you were overwhelmed 
you you felt fire burning through you, your ears buzzed and your eyes went dull when you were in the presence of the beloved. They describe the effects very powerfully. Uh, And so while a sexual desire might be related, it was not the core idea. Uh, In just this way, animals mate and have sexual relations, but no Greek would have called that erotic. Uh, So we're separating out now a mere sexual drive from being in love. And I think that's fair enough that that characterizes him. Is this the same as what romantic love was like in the uh, 19th century? I am inclined to think that what we call romantic love very often involves putting the woman on a pedestal. It acquired an idealization, uh, even maybe going back to Dante and the idea of this divine woman who is more than just virtuous, is transcendent, is angelic. Uh, That Victorian idealization of love turning it into something uh, (coughs) rather watery-eyed, it doesn't strike me as being quite what the ancient Greeks thought. And one of the reasons I say this is that one of the domains in which erotic love was most exercised was with courtesans. That's its locus. That's its standard place. And um, it's with women with whom whom you were never going to marry or even dream of marrying. In many cases, they, you couldn't because they weren't, didn't have the citizen qualifications, and that's what made them find a living in this other sphere. So uh, my sense is the practicalities of ancient life, uh, the sharp contrast between erotic domains for these highly educated but unmarriageable women and then real family life made it quite different from modern romantic love. I wonder whether you have seen any discussions in antiquity about whether a friendship is a result of our free choice or whether it is something predetermined by some supernatural force like uh, Mm -hmm. fate uh, or chance. And if there are such discussions, then what are some of the ethical complexities about how true a friendship can be? Thank Mm -hmm. you. Yes, I think um, that uh, friendship was chosen. It wasn't a sign. It was the difference between family and friends. The, uh, uh, when I um, wanted to describe friendship both in antiquity and today, I called it an elective affective relationship. It's elective in the sense that we choose it. Uh, this was uh, understood to be uh, a choice. Now, of course, if you believe that there's an overarching predestination and everything in life is determined, then it's something else. But within ordinary, our ordinary conceptions, I love my parents because they are my parents, but I choose the circle of my friends. Uh, they, uh, I think that's, that's pretty much um, a standard view. Uh, I'm trying to think of some examples. Uh, once you have a friend, of course, it, presupposes that love is intense and loyalties are very close and people will die for each other. And this is a very odd thing, but even the Epicureans, who believed that the ideal in life was pleasure, said that on occasion a friend will die for a friend. And they held friendship to be the most valuable thing. They go in so far as to say if, if you had to compare friendship and wisdom, friendship would win out. Uh, Epicurus, who was no poet, he did manage to say one beautiful thing. He said, friendship goes dancing around the world. This sense of celebration and joy that you have in friendship. Uh, so it, it, you choose it, but once it's chosen, it becomes part of you. I'd like to go back to Phil's very first question, which you probably don't remember. Um, <laughs> he was asking about the conception of friendship that you... Um, used to hold, but which you no longer do. Um, And I didn't really understand why anyone, including your former self, would have held that view about the ancient world, just given what you said. Mm -hmm. So if someone came down from Mars 
and looked at texts from contemporary, let's just say, American culture. Looked at personal letters, novels, you name it. Of course, they would see the sort of contractual elements that people talked about in friendship. Right. But they'd have to be especially knuckle-headed to think mm-hmm. that that was all there was to friendship, that there wasn't affection, that there weren't emotions. Mm-hmm. But the way you describe the ancient text, it seems like the people who hold the view that the, the business associate model of friendship have a similar knuckle-headed view of the ancient texts. But is that all that's going on? Like, why, why was that view so gripping to so many people, including, I guess, you? Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a very good question. Uh, one thing is, we were all trying to free ourselves from the easy equation of modern attitudes, virtues, sentiments, and ancients. We were trying at that time to say, well, okay, these Greeks, Romans, are at least in Europe and the United States, when in, 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 in the uh, Middle East as well, uh, are the ancestors of our thought, uh, the great philosophers in, in the Greek, in la- writing in Greek and Latin and in Arabic, went back to Aristotle and were analyzing his works and translated, was tra- Aristotle was translated into Arabic in the ninth century already. Uh, we had um, it was an amazing influence. They are our ancestors. They are our ideal. They invented democracy. They invented republicanism. They invented the concept of freedom. We had this worshipful attitude. Uh, Goethe, the great poet, said, yes, you can criticize the ancients, but do so on bended knee. And we were trying to free ourselves from those views. We said, well, you know, they had slavery. Women were not given equal rights. They were very militaristic very militaristic societies, fighting with each other all the time. Uh, Let's take a step back and see whether their values and their attitudes toward things were really similar to ours or perhaps different. So we were predisposed to emphasize difference rather than similarity. It was a stage that I think we had to go through in order not simply to project onto the Greeks our own values. Now, once that was done, there were features of the Greek vocabulary which helped facilitate this move. So, for example, uh, there's a Greek word similar to philia, love, and that means love and friendship, which means dear. And the word is philos, very similar to philia, philos. A philos is a dear one. The word as an adjective means dear. Now, who is your philos? Well, lots of people can be dear to you, but are they friends? Suppose I say, my three-year-old son is very dear to me, but is he a friend? Well, that would be odd, really, to speak of my three-year-old. I wouldn't go out and meet you with my three-year-old son and say, let me introduce you to my friend. It would sound ridiculous. So that, now what I notice, and this is one of the arguments in the book, is that if you put the definite article, the, before the word dear one, the dear one, then it means friend. But people hadn't noticed this. Whenever Greeks want to say, my friends and family, they always say that, my friends and family. They never just include them all. But in some cases, it was dear ones. And so that led people already disposed to see this contractual relationship as if, after all, the same word for friend includes family, and family are, in some sense, if not quite contractually, at least bound by other kinds of duties, well, then friendship had to be the same kind of thing. And I give you one curious case that that emerged. A, A very bright woman wrote a book called Murder Among Friends, and it's a book on Greek tragedy. Murder Among Friends. And she says, Murder Among Friends is is a theme in three quarters of the Greek tragedies we either have or know anything about. There's always murder among friends. Now, I went over all her examples. There is not one Greek tragedy, not one, that is about murder between friends. Not one. It's all family. 
and her failure to pick out this distinction between friends and family because she was thinking dear ones, it led her to make a claim in the title of her book which really made no sense. In fact, it led me to think, as I was reviewing her book, well, how come there are no murders among friends in Greek tragedy? Why is it only family? And that was what, um, hey, she went so far as to talk about somebody murdering a dog. And it's a dear dog. It's clearly not a friend, and no Greek would have thought so. So sometimes a real immersion in the language is necessary to make these distinctions, which we fail to see because we're expecting other kinds of things. And there were also these you know, larger ideological arguments saying, look, in pre-market societies, that That's all right. relations are sort of governed by matters of exchange, and it's not until, you know, say, the 17th, 18th century where you begin to get a separate kind of you know, sense of economics that allows you to have a private sphere to have these kinds of effective relationships that are right. contaminated by you know, the larger market kind of exchanges. So there were, you know, there was, there were these, yes. you know, these were very influential arguments, not just in antiquity, but, but just in general. Mm. The people were working on the, the early yeah. modern period saying, here are all the changes. For the first time we have, you know, a separate market. Well, right. before they didn't, so they couldn't have these kinds yeah. of relations. Well, that's, that's, that's and you hear this coming from, you know, true. Smith and Hume and people like that. So it had a kind of, yeah. You know, it, the idea was exactly that, that in our economic relations, we have obligations. And that leaves a space for our personal life inside the larger economic world where purely affective relations can, can, can exist. And since in the ancient world there wasn't a sphere of market relations so distinct, everything was all combined, well then, their personal relations must have had a market, oh, not a market, but an obligatory quality. Uh, one of my own arguments was that um, the sphere of friendship was defined as a personal sphere against, not in this case, the economic, but against the political, precisely against the political. Within the political demands, there was a space for the private. 